think I'll bring it closer to me. <laughs> so, hello. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much for the last presentation. It was very, we, I was reflecting a lot on like so many things that we can do for, and how can we invest our energy in, in things to change the world. And I hope that with this talk, we can reflect uh, a little bit on that too. So I'm going to talk today about how we can co-invent a future that is more accessible with open source hardware. So my name is Stephanie Valencia. I am a PhD student at the um, HCII, the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I, I like to call myself a maker too, <laughs> and I am very passionate about accessibility. And so I want to talk to you about today about this word, promise. It's a very big word because here is the key of this talk. I, talk, I will talk about open source hardware as a promise for accessibility because it, it can hold a very like game-changing uh, strategy. So let's dive into it. So first, uh, let me tell you a little bit about disability. Disability, uh, the World Health Organization defines it as a condition between the individual and an environment that can have barriers that can hinder their participation with others or with resources. So if the environment is something important in this concept of disability, then if we create the right tools, we can change the situation and make things that were inaccessible, accessible. By creating, for example, a very um, traditional example can be for uh, mobility, uh, making buses have ramps that go to a lower level and things like this for people who are wheelchair users. Uh, but I won't dive too deep into what disability is. For that, I would really recommend for you to read an article I really loved in Wired magazine by Sarah Hendren. Uh, she wrote this article called All Technology is Assistive, and it's wonderful because it talks about how culturally we define disability and how it's so important to be aware of that because how we think of it will affect what we make. So, okay, if we can make tools toward the world more accessible, why is there this problem? About 1 billion people in the world have a disability, but only 5 to 15% of them have access to access technology or technology that can, help, that can enable them to not have these barriers with the environment. And in a world of self-driving cars, I don't know why this happens. So, uh, let me tell you more about myself. I am from a country in South America called Colombia. And in Colombia, we see this a lot. We see this gap. People don't have the assistive technology, as we call it, uh, for example, to go to school. So a lot of children who have communication in, uh, disorders don't have like tablets, don't have any technology that could enable them. Even low-tech technology is hard to acquire so that they can communicate in classroom with their teachers and with others. But this is a worldwide problem. I have listed four reasons here, but there are many others and it's much more complex, but let me get to them. The first one of them is affordability. In many countries, a lot of assistive technologies are covered by the government. So you can have a subsidized um, assistive tech so that you are able to like, acquire it. But we don't have this model in all of the world. Also, these technologies are very expensive, but uh, they don't have to be. <laughs> also, these technologies are not appropriately designed for each user. You know that one size doesn't fit all. So it's the same problem here. Um, we have this one product that you have to make adaptations for, and so the design is also a challenge. Another challenge is that there are amazing developers all over the world, and there are amazing people with very good knowledge about like what their problem is, but they seem not to know each other, and like how can we make this connection better? And the last problem is that there's little innovation in like access technologies. We see iterations of the same interfaces or iterations of the same things, but what, why don't we see a more accelerated growth? So the World Health Organization, um, I know this is, you might be taking my word for it, but also they have a lot of uh, calls that they've made to the public because they are aware of this need. So you can go to their website and see how these technologies are needed. 
I really like this book, second recommendation to read. It's called Design Meets Disability by Graham Pullen. He gets to a really good point. He says that the design issues around disability are underexplored. They demand and deserve far more radical approaches. What is needed is truly interdisciplinary design thinking and combining and blurring the design craft of engineers who are really good at, at things and with therapeutic excellence and the broadest experience of disabled people. So I really want to just provoke your thought today on how open source hardware can be a game changer in this scenario. Because open source hardware solutions are, well, you know what they are, are. They invite a community to build upon hacks that other people have made and invent solutions for unmet needs. And this is exactly what we need in space. So in this community, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but we all understand the power of making. But I really want to get your attention to see how this power of making can be have a greater impact in this scenario of access technology. It brings people together, experts, users, non-experts, and connects them to really, really get at these unmet needs. And I think for me this is the ideal scenario where you have people who uh, form a team and come from different backgrounds. Occupational therapists, designers, artists, students, beginners, the users, the health experts, psychologists, everybody. So I want to give you some examples of some um, organizations that I think you should really check out and uh, get inspired from. The first one is the DIY Ability Organization. The DIY Ability Organization is located in New York. But they have an online community. And they um, do adaptive, um, well, they do many things. But one of my favorite things that they do is that they help customize toys for children who may have motor impairments and may not be um, able to directly access the switch or like the different controls for a toy. So they teach you, if you go on their website, DIYAbility.org, you can check out how to make an adaptive switch with the toys. A second uh, community that I really like, and I just met this summer in Seattle at the Mini Maker Fair, is the Makers Making Change uh, in Canada. What they do is they have a website where you literally can just log in and put up where you are at in the world, let's say uh, here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you can see who uh, are organizing and who has registered to start making. And you can get together with people to make things. So uh, two of the products I'm showing here from them is a bottle holder. Uh, here they just uh, designed um, two rings that are connected and that they can help the user just pull up their bottle uh, from the bottom part of the wheelchair in an easy way. And then we can see here in the other image we have a fork and it's just um, a way to grip it in a, in a more ergonomic way. Another one of my heroes is the Adaptive Design Association. They're located in New York and they are amazing with cardboard. They do magic with cardboard. And they uh, do all kinds of customizations uh, to create user-specific adaptations from this uh, orthotic um, prosthetic here that I'm, that I'm wearing, this orthotic device, or from like, let's say you don't have a computer, but you really need a screen, like a document reader because you cannot really see that text. Well, this is a very elegant solution in which you can just use your phone with a text-to-speech uh, application and then just read from a distance what, what document that you couldn't access before. But now I have some examples of how you could do this uh, and some examples that I have the luck to participate in. One of them is this one. <laughs> this is um, one of my favorite projects. We were able to um, work all together. This is the teammates with uh, Danny, who's in the, in the middle of the picture. We uh, decided to do a one week long hackathon in which we would understand what Danny's um, needs and met needs were. And so we uh, got together for a week, all of these uh, friends, and we decided to um, explore and see what we could build together. One of the most interesting things we learned is that Danny has uh, cerebral palsy, but he also has 
a visual impairment that makes him hard for him to distinguish between ramps and stairs. So we, ad we adapted his wheelchair and augmented it with sensors that would tell him different, uh, to differentiate between this by giving him vibration feedback and also auditory feedback. So by adding these different sensors around his wheelchair, he could know um, if he was approaching some steps or a ramp and he could, he could align his wheelchair to just go the right way. Another very dear project is a project in which we collaborated with an NGO in Rwanda and we and some students at Yale University and we started a group to think about uh, inclusive uh, education. So earlier I talked to you about these communication devices that are lacking in Colombia or they're lacking in Rwanda too so and we received a lot of help from them to do this project. So we're thinking how could we design a low cost communication device? And the communication device that we wanted was a device that could uh, use RFID technology to easily be reprogrammed and uh, be able to be very like robust and allow us to record a voice uh, for tax to teach uh, children like uh, pictogram words or simple words so that they could start using different sentences. The same product that we were getting into in the market costs around $3,000. And our product is below $100. And it's called eDream, which means boys in Kinja Rwanda. What I really liked about this project is that we developed it with students together. So we just went to like off-the-shelf components and started looking at like how we could do it. And so it has a MyFair RFID chip. We were thinking about how we would power it out there in Rwanda. And we then got there and realized, OK, this might not be working too much. And we were able to visit the Fab Lab, make some repairs. It was so easy to explain. You just opened it, and it's like, this, is, this goes here, this goes there. And it really gets up to another problem of technologies being low cost and accessible. And it's like, how can they be sustainable in time? And if we all do it open, well, it's easier. So I had the word future in my talk, too, because I think it's very important to know where we're going. And the future I imagine is a future where people can make and build their own solutions, where resources are shared for f people to iterate. Here we are. <laughs> when we tackle problems that are unmet because need no pair up with developers, or they learned on their own and pair up with people who can teach them where the schematics that we share and the tools uh, we use can also be uh, accessed by everyone. And when we can really innovate and change uh, the future of what it means to uh, be disabled. So I will leave with this uh, phrase that I take from Annie Seguera, who is an activist and a YouTuber that I really like and who designed my t-shirt. <laughs> and she says that the future is accessible. So thank you very much. <laughs>